This is an oral history interview with Dusha Weisskopf. It's May 29th, 2009. I'm Forrest Larson in the MIT Lewis Music Library. It's my honor and privilege to welcome Dusha Weisskopf for this interview. She was the music librarian when the Hayden Library building opened in 1950. Today is May 29th, 2009. I'm Forrest Larson. We're in the MIT Lewis Music Library. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> so to start off with, um, can you tell me what year you were born? I was born in 1924, so I'm 84 years old. Fantastic. <laughs> and can you tell me where you were born? And I was born in Munich. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, and your family's last name was Schmidt. Schmidt. Yes. yes. Um, what were your parents' first names? Willy and Kate. And your f um, f father was also known as Wilhelm. Is that correct? Well, not really. Not yeah, really. I mean, that was his name. But yeah. you know, it's it's like somebody would use a sort of nickname, like right. Will Schmidt or Willy right. Schmidt in this right. case. Did you have, you had other siblings, right? Yes, I had a brother named Thomas, uh, who was two, two and a half years younger. And then I had a sister named Hedi, H-E-D-I, from Hedwig. She's still alive, and she was uh, seven years younger than I was. My. So we had a lot of fun. It was a jolly household. Anything you want to talk about Munich and all that? Um? Well, you know, it was a beautiful town first of all, still is, and um, we had a very happy life because we would go to the country a lot, and we would also go to um, the Isar Anlagen, which were kind of like Philadelphia's, there's the river, and all the way along the river on both sides, there's green, free places, and also in Munich, you can bathe in the river. Oh my. So, you know, we would go down there and not so much bathe because I don't think my father was totally sure it was clean, which probably was because the water came from the mountains. But we would walk on the pebbles and play with the pebbles and have a wonderful time. <laughs> so, and he was um, involved in musical life in Munich a lot, so. We'll get to that in was, a minute. Yeah. Uh, so were there any um, early musical memories from Munich that you, you know, concerts that you went to that you recall? I know you were, you were a young girl then. But. I was very young, yes. I mean, my father died when I was nine and a half. But I did go to the Magic Flute with him. Uh -huh. It was that, the Christmas before he was killed. It, it was, um, and he used to sing to me that, that important parts of the magic flutes, flute, and I absolutely loved it. I also had a long, light blue velvet dress, and I was thrilled out of my mind <laughs> <laughs> to be by his side, you know, yeah. going there. And it yeah. was, of course, it was a marvelous thing. And we used to also go to the puppet theater, and the puppet theater in Munich sometimes does Bastien and Bastien, mm -hmm. and you know, for children, that was yeah. wonderful. And you forget, you forgot that they were puppets. You were absolutely <laughs> sure they were people. Uh, <laughs> it was uh, very nice. Yeah. Uh, um, was your mother also a musician? Did she play? No, or sing? she did not play. She used to play the piano before she married my father, and then she thought she'd better quit. Uh -huh. <laughs> she wasn't. She wasn't very good. You know, she was just school pianist. Uh -huh. So, um, no, but she was very musical, and um, in her later life, you know, she she helped start the Santa Fe Opera, and she um, used to do um, the chamber music personnel for Santa Fe, and then for Los Alamos also. Oh, my goodness. So she was very, I mean, she knew all the musicians and liked them a lot. Mm -hmm. Wow, wow. So, um, when did you come to the United States? In 1938, 1938. just after Hitler took Austria. Mm. Mm. 
So I had some questions about your your father Willie. Um, um, as you told me, he was a professional cellist, but also played the viola da gamba. Can you tell yes. me about his work as a cellist? Did he play in orchestras? No, he. What he thought he could do when you know before they were married, he was to write letters to my mother. They were far apart, and he he used to say, well, you know, after this hard time, meaning the depression. It, is over, I can probably, um, no, it did, wasn't the depression, it was when the money was not worth anything. And in 1922, mm -hmm. the, you know, the dollar used to be worth four or ten marks, and then it went to hundreds of thousands of marks. Wow. So it was a, a crazy time. But he said, after this is over, I can probably get place in one of the good quartets. Well, by good quartet, he's talking about the Bush Quartet. Mm -hmm. I'm not totally sure he would have gotten that. But he was a really good cellist and quite confident that he could make a living as a cellist. But then, since they had absolutely no money, he figured out a way he could marry my mother, becoming a teacher in an elementary school. Uh -huh. And that would give him a state income, and he would be safe, and they would be happy. So that's what happened. And he then, um, in the late 20s, became very interested in ancient music. And, you know, he was sort of a pioneer of that whole movement. And that's he would, correct. He would just be so thrilled if he ever saw the Boston Early Music Festival. He would right. be out of his mind. So he assembled uh, instruments and he played. The, it's still sometimes played. Harvard has the instru instruments and he uh, has a cello that was built by Barrack Norman in England in the 17th century. I mean, a, a gamba. Mm -hmm. So it's quite wonderful. So I was reading that he had studied with somebody named Christian Doberreiner. Yes. Yeah. And yes. he founded the, the Munich Vial Quintet. Yes. Yeah. That's right. And they used to go on tours. They went to Italy and so forth. And, uh, they played. He has such nice memories of Italy because he's, it's called Five Vials Travel Through Italy. And at one point he writes about they ate, ate at a at a little inn called the Five Violets, <laughs> meaning violets. <laughs> yeah. He said, we, we weren't exactly violets, but we ate there anyway. Wow. So, so he kept a journal that you've been reading? Or? Well, no, he, actually my mother published a book after he was killed of some of the things he had uh -huh. written. These were partly also reports to the newspapers that he worked for. Right. And um, he, um, and also, I was lucky enough to have all their love letters to each other. And they met in 1918, and these love letters went on till 21, because they couldn't get married before that. He had, to, he had been badly wounded in the First World War, mm. so it took him a long time to get better. And he finally did, and then he was going back to college, he, you know. He had been studying in Rome when the war started, and so he went back home to Germany. But he'd only had about a year and a half of university. So the poor guy was, I mean, five years of his life went into the war, what with the wounds and all that. So he, um, he was way behind, but My. he managed. Wow. Did he happen to know the harpsichordist Wanda Landowska? He went to Paris once to see her, and what he said was, you know, she plays absolutely incredibly wonderfully, but she is such a snob that he, he said, you just don't quite know how to handle her, uh -huh. you know. Uh -huh. just, so he, yes, but he had, he had two harpsichordists in Munich. One was called Julia Menz, M-E-N-Z, and one was called, um, I don't remember the other one's name, uh -huh. Julia Mentz he really respected very highly. Mm -hmm. 
So as you mentioned, he was a music critic. There was a newspaper, uh, if I can pronounce the German correctly, Münchner Neueste Nachrichten. Yes, Nachrichten, yeah. yes, that's yeah. right. Um, how long did he um, write for, for that paper? Do you know approximately? Yes, I know exactly, because he used to write for a Bavarian paper called the Bayerische Kurier. And then in 1933, when Hitler fired all the Jews from all official, you know, and that was considered an official, don't ask me why, job. Uh, that that place at the Münchner Neuste became vacant, and my father took it because he was in, in terrible trouble. This was after the Depression, and the Depression just had come to Germany. And there were six million, as you know from Hitler, six million people out of work in Germany in a, in a population of, I think, sort of 50 million. <laughs> Unbelievable. So he did take that job, and he only worked for them a year because then he was killed. Mm. He was 41 in April and was killed in June of 34. Yeah, it was unbelievably horrible. So, was your father also interested in uh, some of the modern composers, Hindemith and Schoenberg? Yes, he was. Yeah. In fact, I have Hindemith's signature in a guest book, and they called each other Du, you know, Tu, mm -hmm. which was nice. Um, yes, he, he knew him, and he also knew um, a Swiss composer named Willy Schu, I think. Uh-huh. No. Otmar Schuck, that's it. Oh, uh -huh. yes, yeah. yes. So, you know, these were people who were around and he highly respected them. Mm -hmm. And um, I think his favorite was the old music, also, you know, personal. And I was amazed as a little kid that yeah. there was an English composer. <laughs> How could there be an English composer? But anyway. Um, so. And he, then his his great favorites, of course, were Bach and Mozart. Mm -hmm. no, no contest. He worked with a guy named um, yes, Gräser, Wolfgang Gräser. And Gräser is the one who first reconstituted the art of fugue. Uh, how do you spell his last name? G R A E S E R. Okay. But he died very, very young, and it, which was a tragedy for my father because they had been going to try to publish a book on that work. My. And, um, you know, he, he killed himself. He was an extremely gifted, very young man and just didn't, couldn't last through seriously producing in one field. You know, he, he learned Chinese, he was a fantastic mathematician, he was all over the place. So, my, yeah. my. But yes, he, my father, I must say, sort of deified Mozart and Bach, mm -hmm. but he also liked some of the moderns. What did you think of Arnold um, Schoenberg? You know, I, I'm sure he must have written about him, and I don't remember, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I could look it up. Yeah. Well, there's some other stuff that, after this interview that comes up, that you think might be relevant, because here's a chance to, for the historical record, more things about your father than what are out there. Yes, um, and yes. He was a significant Str person, particularly in the field of early music in Germany yes. at the time. Yes, and he was. And, of course, Döbrenner was a, a wonderful teacher. And there was quite a lot of early music in Munich. And again, I don't, I can't think of the man who is the best known of those people. Mm -hmm. But my father could also be quite critical. For example, the Hindemith, he had a brother, would put on old music, ancient music performances, you know, and my father's eyebrows would go up very high, and he would say, they have no idea of what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, 
Are there other um, musicians in your family, either amateur or professional? Uh, not really, no. I have all these, I have four children, and the most musical is, is Matthew, who plays um, guitar and the banjo for mostly, and the, he and his wife sing a lot. Mm -hmm. And uh, my grandson, their son, plays the clarinet and plays uh, guitar. And then another grandson plays guitar. So that's about as high as we mm -hmm. have come. <laughs> I'm still hoping. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So tell me about, um, you had piano lessons as a, as a young girl? Well, up to a point. I, I, they, my father had already died. My mother thought it would be a good idea for me to learn the piano. And I sort of said, I hate the piano, you know. So I laboriously took a few lessons and learned basically nothing. Mm -hmm. And then I um, tried to also learn the cello, and I was very lazy about practicing, so that never went anywhere. So I was a total loss. My brother also, I think, took piano and then played the violin for a while. And my sister, Heidi, also took piano and also you know, just got, was a pupil, so to speak. Did you have any voice lessons? No. Because my, my father's sister had voice lessons and sang wonderfully. And then her daughter, to this day, she's 76, sings in a church choir. Fantastic. Yeah, she's lovely, nice woman. So you sang in choirs, so at some point, you, you, when did you start singing in choirs? Yeah, well, um, I, I sang at, I went to the Cambridge School in Weston, and so I sang in that a lot. Mm -hmm. And then in college, I really didn't. But then when I got here, you know, Klaus was doing the Messiah, so very pleased yeah. to help him do the Messiah. And I have a question about that one later in the interview, so <laughs> that's, that's good. So which college did you go to? I went to Smith, uh huh. and I absolutely loved it. It was a wonderful experience, and I majored in history. Uh-huh. What, what part of, what theory of history were you interested European in? European mm -hmm. intellectual history, what mm -hmm. else is no mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. But we had we had a wonderful music department at Smith. I mean, it was extraordinary. Uh, one of the people who was there was Alfred Einstein, who had oh, been yes. a critic in Munich before my right, father, yeah, right. and knew my father. And I sometimes went to see the Einsteins. And he always was very cute because people would, you know, sort of be coil when they heard his name. And he said, "I'm only the cousin." <laughs> 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 nice wow. man. Wow. Um. But that was the other thing. Uh, um, I can't recall his name. I'm ashamed to say. I'll look it up when I get home. The the um, head of Smith was extremely conscientious and alert to hiring refugee professors like Alfred Einstein. Mm -hmm so that they would have some sort of way to live in the U.S. once they had escaped. You know, people came here and didn't know what kind of a job they could get. Yeah, wow. So he was very wonderful and conscientious about giving them jobs. Wow. Were there any um, concerts that happened at Smith when you were there that you, that you recall, or any particular events? That well, there, yes, I mean, there were wonderful concerts all the time, and I, of course, mostly I went to the chamber music concerts, and the Budapest Quartet would come. And <laughs> There's still nobody like them, yeah. in my opinion. <laughs> but, um, so I would go to all those, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I don't recall a specific wow. one. So, of your choral music experiences, is there, uh, I know you said you sang The Messiah with Klaus Leitman. Was yeah. there any other um, stuff that you did that are particularly No, um, you know, it wasn't very good. I mean, I had a normal voice, but nothing to, mm -hmm. s to boast about. But 
it's a wonderful story too the Koreans you know I, I have some I used to have a Korean relative and if you can talk you can sing it's their conviction mm -hmm. you know don't give me you can't sing yeah. you can talk yeah. so sing you know it was wonderful <laughs> anyway um, so we my brother and I used to sing all the time you know I mean driving around wherever mm -hmm. all the time and then uh, I was thrilled when I went to Smith because it, at the time they had a chapel requirement. You had to go to chapel every, I think it was every Wednesday morning, and we got to sing hymns. And of course I'd been brought up Catholic, so we had, we had never sung hymns in our lives. That's right. So I got there and I thought, whoa, is this fantastic. <laughs> Just, it was great. Mm. I, one, one thing I do remember which I should maybe cite. I remember going to the great mass in C minor mm -hmm. by Mozart at the cathedral in Salzburg. And, you know, it was, I'll never forget it, it was just unbelievable. Uh, the cathedral is a, is a Baroque, beautiful Baroque mm -hmm. building. So. Do you remember who was performing? No, no. sorry. That's yeah, okay. But I was there during the 37, um, festivals and you know Lotte Lehmann all these really great artists mm -hmm. Toscanini yeah. everybody was there and we would hear constant conversation about how he was what he did where he went mm -hmm. <laughs> how it sounded uh, about all these people so we were very much tuned into that but they didn't take us because the seats, of course, were ridiculously expensive. Yeah. So I would, my, my way of interacting with that summer was to go to the Mass, and it was totally unforgettable. Wow. I, it's hard to ask somebody about their, their, their favorite music or their favorite composers, but just to get an idea about what, um, what you want oh, to Oh, yes. And, and and I'm get, you know, that's another thing. My father, I loved it. They had no money. And he wrote to my mother, I just bought all the Beethoven quartets and had them bound in real leather because after all, that's something you need your whole life. <laughs> so, wow. Don't ask what it costs. Yeah. <laughs> but so, yeah, uh, I'm just like my father, Bach first, and then Beethoven, Mozart, Schubert, just completely conventional and the older I get the more I gravitate toward those people mm -hmm. so um, I'm not terribly enterprising I I mean you know I love Stravinsky Britain etc etc but if it comes to I think consolation mm -hmm. I have to go back to those mm -hmm. totally conventional Great composers. And Monteverdi. Of course, yeah. yeah. So I have some more questions uh, later um, about 20th century music, and we'll get there. Um, so how did it come that you, um, work out that you came to work at, at MIT in the Eastman Library? And they served, um, the subjects were mathematics, chemistry, and physics. Yes, that was, well, I'm not totally sure, but I was interviewed by Dr. Tate and another man whose name I don't remember now. And Dr. Tate was director of libraries. Yes, yeah. he was. Um, and I don't know why I came to MIT, but I just did. You know, I, partly it was because it was near here. We lived in Central Square on Chestnut Street mm -hmm. for in a little tiny apartment. It was great. If you turned the bed down, you could reach the icebox from the bed. <laughs> <laughs> but, so it was near here, you know, I thought that would be a handy place to work. And sometimes I only had a nickel left at the end of the week, because I got paid by the week here. So then I would walk. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so it was handy. Um, and they, when they were interviewing me, I think to some extent they may have gotten confused because 
I thought they were asking me what my stepfather's job was, and I told them he worked at ANSCO, which was a photographic corporation in Binghamton, New York. And I'm not sure that they didn't think that maybe I worked there, which I did in the summer at, in chemical packing. <laughs> <laughs> but I was not skilled, a skilled worker. So somehow they hired me to work at the Eastman Library with Miss Chamberlain, who was the head of it. Miss Chamberlain was from Maine and extremely strict. So, I mean, literally, you would come in in the morning and you wouldn't dare go to the bathroom till noon. It was, I mean, you, you were there to work. <sighs> But she was the best training. I mean, she was wonderful. I, I, I really liked her a lot, but I was terrified of her also. Oh. So anyway, that's where I worked for about a year and a half. Right, and that was November 1948. That's, that's the records that I'm finding. That's right, yeah. yes. Okay. yes. Um, so how does it come about that you became the music librarian? Well, I, you know, I must have heard I don't know how you hear those things, but I must have heard that they were looking for one. And of course, I was extremely enthusiastic immediately you know, mm -hmm. and thought I would be good for that. Mm -hmm. Don't ask why. But so I applied yeah. and I got it. So I found some, some records that at least by September of 1949, you were the music librarian. Mm -hmm. I found mm -hmm. a memo from. Um, Vernon Tate to Klaus Liebman referring to you, and mm -hmm. so it was by, by, at least by September 1949. Yes, yes. Um, when you began as music librarian, your last name was Ziegel, and then it changed to Scott. Was mm -hmm. this related to your marriage to Peter Scott? That's right. Be he changed his name from Ziegel to Scott when uh -huh. he became a citizen. Uh-huh. Yes. Because there's some annual reports that have both of your names. Uh, yes, Just for clarification. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Um, when you came to MIT, the Hayden Library building had not been completed yet, um, and there wasn't a second or separate music library. It was over in Walker, and there was a, yes. a separate wing there. Where in Walker was the music collection? Do you remember? I don't remember. I'm sorry to uh, say. The only thing I remember from that year is that we were sorting the books, but this was humanities books. Uh, a, a librarian from the Humanities Library and I were sorting all that stuff, getting ready for the move. Mm -hmm. And I really don't remember having... I, I don't even remember that the kids had access to the music library, but maybe they did. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Because there was no place to play anything. Right, right. Um, do you remember how big the, the collection was before the move? How big the music collection was? No, I'm uh -huh. sorry to say. That's okay. Um, according to Anna Re Library Anna Reports, the, the record library in Walker was very popular. Um, yes, uh, yes. Uh, it was. Do you remember how many record players they had? Um, um, I would say about seven. Mm -hmm. Something mm -hmm. like that. And then they had to sign up to use the room. And nobody could use it more than an hour if there were people waiting. Uh -huh. So was each record player in a separate room? Yes. Yeah. yes. And so they played over speakers or did they have headphones? They played over speakers. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's nice. That's nice. And then we played, you know. I, I don't know how that ever got started. We played from 10 to 5. Right, that's after you move to the, the, the new library. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Yeah. Um, the um, library annual report from 1947-48 uh, mentions hiring of a, as they put it, a competent music librarian. This was before you were hired. Was there, so there, was there an actual another music librarian before you started? That's what I don't know. Uh -huh. Not that I know. I, I'm wondering if that maybe that was referring to, to you, but it was from the end report of 1947-48. Yeah. yeah. Wondering if you knew. When I was still working for yeah. Miss Chamberlain. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so the original plans for the Hayden Library building was to have a music room, as they called it, and not an official music library. 
um, and the Hidden Library was dedicated May 19th, 1950. Do you recall any conversations about its plans for a music room as opposed to a music library did? Uh, well, I, I don't really recall a specific conversation, but I think that the, the image was to have more or less of a lounge in which they could listen to music. Mm -hmm. And we had some books, but not a, a very large collection. And we had music. Right. For them to play. So it um, looks like you, you were saying you probably you don't remember too much about the, the move to the, to the hidden building. I don't. Um, it, I, that's just wiped out in my mind. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. I really don't remember that. Um, and the, um, the dedication ceremony uh, um, in May 19, 1950, do you, do you remember any of that? Well, what I remember about that <laughs> was that I think Dean Bircher talked to me about, you know, having the place look tidy and so forth. Mm -hmm. So it would be at its impressive best. And I wasn't invited to the party. So I thought, okay. Um, you know, it, again, it was a different time. I mean, I think in his own way, Mr. Burchard was a real snob, but he was also a very nice man. Mm -hmm. When he was interacting with you, he was fine. But there were certain things you didn't do. <laughs> so that, that has stayed in my mind, I must wow. admit, you know. So there was a, um, a piano trio commissioned from um, the composer Bo Bohuslav Martinu. Yes. Do you remember anything about that commission, and did people talk about the piece? They must have, but I don't remember it. But I, I think of Martinu very highly. Uh -huh. Did you ever meet him? No. Uh, but you, you obviously know his music. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, so when you became the, the uh, music librarian um, sometime around September 1949, how would you describe your basic responsibilities? Um, okay. For one, I, th I don't think the catalog had been finished. And I, was, I know I was busy making catalog cards, mm -hmm. you know, typing them on one of those things that had, had a special way to attach the three by five cards. Right. So <laughs> that was busy work, but there was lots of it. And, um, you know, to keep track of the records, to also um, be in charge of the, at that time it was all boys. As far as I know, there wasn't a girl in sight. Maybe there was one, but I never, you know, interacted mm -hmm. with that girl. So I was in charge of the boys helping me, uh, giving out records and so forth, so I could be typing while they were doing that. How many mm. student assistants did you have, uh, approximately? Uh, yeah, quite a few, because there were, you know, it was mornings and afternoons, and five days a week, so I would say somewhere like ten. Mm -hmm. Were you responsible for hiring them as well? Yes, mm -hmm. yes, mm -hmm. and you know, they were a mixed lot, but I remember some with great affection. There was Kazi Ahmed, who was from Pakistan. Well, from from India at the time, because uh -huh. the, the separation hadn't happened yet. And then it was separated, and he, I don't think he ever went back, and I think his father died while he was here. And, you know, I sort of thought the sacrifices they must have gone through to send him here. It was very sad. And then there was Mort Grosser, who was a unique person, wonderful. Yeah, he's um, been um, a very generous benefactor to the music library. It's we so just got great. a package in the mail from him yesterday. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, he was, he was a lot of fun. And... Um, various others so 
So he actually worked for you? I think he did, or if he didn't, he was in here all the time. Mm -hmm. um, I think he was one of those. Uh -huh. And, oh, there was somebody from Finland, and he used to borrow a, a bassoon concerto by, I can't remember, by an Englishman. <laughs> You know, and he would come and borrow the bassoon concerto time after time. I finally said, you know, what is it you like so much about that bassoon concerto? And he said, it reminds me of the, the not losing it. What are they? Not elks. It reminds Trolls. me. Trolls. No, of yeah. the moose in my father's garden. Oh, uh -huh. It reminds me of the moose in my father's uh -huh. garden. That was the explanation right. of why right. he liked it so much. Wow. So we had a lot of fun. We really did. Yeah. And sometimes I would get mad at them because also there was also a schedule of when we would play opera, when we would play chamber music, when we would play symphonies, etc., etc. Certain days of the week so that if people liked that kind of music they could come in at a suitable time. And, you know, sometimes the kids would start out quite innocent and would like, you know, Carmen or whatever. S sort of fairly simple stuff. And then they would realize there was other stuff and they would graduate. And in time they would dominate playing the late Beethoven quartets and I would get really <laughs> mad and say, you know, you've got to vary it a little yeah. bit, you know. He's not the only one who wrote quartets. You. <laughs> so it was it was a lot of fun. Do you remember a student, Lionel Kinney? He had been president of the Combined Musical Clubs. He remembers you. Does he? Yeah. Um, that's how I found out about you, because when I interviewed him, I was went to the archives to, 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 um, to, to get you know, the correct form of your name. Um, and then the archives told me that they had seen you last last fall. So, yes, yes. Um, but he remembers you fondly. Uh, oh, that's so nice. Yeah, I, I don't really remember that. I mean, they're they're boys that are in my mind that I can see in front of me, but I I can't attach any name to them, so mm -hmm. I can't tell you about them. Mm -hmm. But there were, you know, there were also funny incidents of people sort of thinking. I own the music library, I can do anything I want. And one boy, once, I know, he had lost his gubs in a in a taxi ride. So he said, can I just call the taxi company and see if they found them? So I said, yeah, well, for a minute you can. You know. mm -hmm. Well, it turned in, into a 10-minute conversation with the boy saying, you stole them, and the, kid, the others saying, no, we didn't, and it went on and on. And I was really embarrassed for having let him use the phone. And I said, yeah. you cannot do that. I meant, say it, yeah. get off the phone. No. So, you know, I think they, sometimes they, they thought, you know, I was nice to them, but I didn't encourage that kind of ownership yeah. privilege, you know, so. Yeah. So you also provided reference services, people coming in asking questions about music and helping people find things. Yes, yes. Were there other people who helped you with that? Were there any humanities librarians that helped you with reference services? Or were you the... Not that the, I remember. Uh -huh. yeah. um, and, you know, I, I really enjoyed all that. I mean, I like getting into it. Uh, and at the time, I had some concept of what I was doing, but I, you know, it was quickly forgotten with four babies in close succession. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just wiped it all out. When you mm. were working on cataloging, and I see from your inner reports, there was quite a backlog of things. Mm -hmm. Did the, the cataloging department give you any training? And they must have, yes. And also Miss Chamberlain had given me some. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And there was a way to do it, and you know, right. this was it, and you better do it right. So, right. Yes. Um, other things about your your 
basic responsibilities. Um, did you, you must have like ordered equipment and supplies and things like Did you have authority to, to order? Um, Records. Or, or um, office supplies and things like that. Um, well, I must have, yes, yeah. but, but it was the records that were fun. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. Right. <laughs> and I, I would try to find cheaper places, um, you know, to order records so that the money would go further. Mm -hmm. um, I can remember when the, what is that catalog called? There used to be a catalog that listed all available records. Oh, Schwann? Schwann. Yeah, when that started, Smart Eye said, that's never going to go anywhere. Nobody cares about that. <laughs> I was wrong. <laughs> it took off like a rocket. <laughs> so the administrative uh, relationship with uh, what at the time was known as the English and History Library, which became the Humanities Library, what was the administrative relationship like? How much autonomy did the music library have? I think we had a lot. Mm -hmm. they, they, uh, they were very pleasant and just basically let me do what I thought was right. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would, of course, also consult Cal mm -hmm. so and Greg Tucker. I mean. Right, right. Who did you so, report to in the libraries if, if you had like a supervisor? I don't remember. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, there was a humanities librarian, Burton Roby, um, yes. who at some point, I think after your time, seemed to be more involved in some of the music library stuff. There were some cataloging issues that he uh, came, um, that he worked with. Mm -hmm. But did you work with him at all? I knew him, and I I'm, I don't remember whether I worked with him. Um, uh, Barbara Soderberg was came after me, didn't she? That's right. And she, um, I think she worked with him more than I did. Mm -hmm. do you, what do you recall about Barbara? Uh, oh, she was a delight. She was a cheery, lovely person. And her father was dean of engineering, I think. Uh huh. But I, that's all, you know. Yeah. Was she a, a musician? Do you know what her musical background was? No, I don't. Uh-huh. No. Uh. I didn't know her well. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really, you know, pretty much totally dropped out once I had the baby. And, right. and we lived in Dorchester by that time, so it was a long way to come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so at the time, the director of libraries was Vernon Tate, and mm -hmm. read some some memos. It seems like he had an active interest in the the, the music library. Um, there were things about this this new sound system, stereo system that he took great pride in, um, and various other things. What are your recollections of of Vernon Tate? Well, he was a big, hearty kind of fellow. Um, he it, it, you know, one of the stories I remember, he did some research on the Spanish in California, and he had a wonderful story saying that one of the Spaniards wrote, wrote home in the 16th century or so, saying, it rains so much we can't irrigate, <laughs> which was charming. And he, he was a person who was interested in many things, such as the engineering of the library, certainly, of the music library. So, you know, but there was, there was a sort of a real break with him. Um, I invited them to dinner at one point, and um, they came, and, you know, everything was going along nicely. and. And he started to tell a story, and I don't remember the, the, the exact terms of what the story was about, but in the course of that, he said, a big black negro, a big black buck negro at my table. 
and I just about fell off my chair and, you know, found it very hard to continue the conversation. And, you know, that was that really, in my mind, it made it the end of what was never a friendship, but it, it was a relationship to a boss. And I thought, well, I can't deal with that. That was that. Mm -hmm. Did you get a sense from him what he envisioned for the, the music library? Did From what, him? Yeah. No. 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 So we've mentioned peripherally, and we'll have, I have a lot of questions about uh, Professor Klaus Leitman. He was the first professor of music at MIT who came in 1947, and he had a very active role in the music library. Um, mm -hmm. How would you describe his his role and uh. well it, he was a a very lively um, man full of ideas and you know thought that of course people with the kind of education that MIT was offering should learn about music it was a given no arguments and and of course, I agreed with that, so that was um, very nice. And he was extremely active. He did many, many things. He taught, um, I think, very well. He, uh, of course, he, the assignments he would give would be records that would go out all the time, you know. And I think he gave a, a thorough overview to the boys, as it still was, and the conducting was wonderful. He uh, he also played. I remember he played. He and Greg Tucker played. Um, it's a sonata for violin and piano, and I can't sing by Frank. Uh huh. And you know, it was yes, great stuff. And he was full of life, a little bit on a on a much smaller scale, the way my husband Victor Weisskopf was. Mm -hmm. He was uh, up and at it, mm -hmm. full of beans. What was his violin playing like? It was good. Mm -hmm. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a great master, but it was good. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. As far as his um, role with the. Um, the, the, the music library, something he was very active in, in selecting records, books, and yes, scores. Yes. Um, was there any other administrative um, authority that he had um, as far as how the music library ran? Or was that pretty much, that was your... I, I think, you know, I mean, he may, have, he may have had some advice for me or whatever, mm -hmm. which I don't remember, but yeah. he, was, he was extremely pleasant and easy to get along with and you know, we were all trying to do the same thing, That's so right. it was easy. Yeah, I mean, this was the, the, the very beginnings of both the music library and the music department. Yes. Can yeah. you talk about kind of what that, um, what that felt like? You prob did you have a sense that something was, was kind of being, being born? Well, I don't know if I had that sense, but I certainly had a sense of that, it, that it was an exciting, it was an exciting job. It was, you know, we were doing stuff worth doing. It was, mm -hmm. it was wonderful. And Greg Tucker was a, a big ingredient in that. He, um, he was such a charming man and played the piano wonderfully and would play, you know, uh, what's his name? I, can hear I, have, I have some more Greg Tucker questions okay. later, so maybe right. it'll go yes. in your head. And I hope so, come yes. Up. Yeah. Um, but it was, um, you know, Klaus was uh, certainly very interested in modern music, in Hindemith, for example, and we would be beaming and going ahead on all burners. Uh, did Klaus know um, Paul Hindemith? 
I don't know whether he did it or not. Hindemith was at Yale by that time. Yeah, I think. right. But I don't know whether he knew him or not. Uh -huh. I wondered. Uh, yeah. uh, because in Klaus's autobiography, he, he never mentions a personal relationship, but he um, mentions Hindemith a, a few times. And I just wondered if he was being modest and not saying that he knew him, but in fact he might have. And I wondered. I don't know that. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Did um, Klaus talk to you about uh, kind of his vision, long-term vision for the music library, and kind of what, how he wanted it to um, to be in in the future? Well, I, I he certainly did talk to me about you know what what the aim of the whole music department was, which mm -hmm. was to get these guys up to speed on music and of course we also had some very musical kids. That's right. So uh, it was, it, and he, I think he felt that it was a, a huge opportunity to do something with very bright kids who would, you know, be leaders of some sort in the future. Right. And th that was exciting. Did he talk to you about um, when he was talking about his vision for the music program and how it was different from what would be offered at a liberal arts school where there were more, at, well there were no music majors at the time, but um, he had seemed to have some, some, some clear ideas about what was different about MIT's music program. And did he talk to you about that? No, I, I don't recall that, but um you know, one of the things that I liked so much about him was that he was completely free of any kind of snobbism or any attitude of, you know, I know this stuff and you'll be lucky if I give you part of my knowledge. He thought they were entitled to know anything he knew. Mm -hmm. And that, I think, is a wonderful way to teach. You know, you're not sort of saying, it's a special reserve, it's mine, it's mine. He's mm -hmm. saying is for everybody to try it. And that was lovely. I, I liked that. Did you see him, um, observe him teaching in a, in a class? You, you must have at some point. I must have. I, I remember he taught Yesu Joy of Man's Desiring, which you know, mm -hmm. I love beyond words. So he, he he did have that enthusiasm that mm -hmm. would transfer to the kids, mm -hmm. pretty much. Did the students talk to you much about about him and what what they they thought of him as a teacher? No, not. I mean, maybe they did. I mm -hmm. don't remember, but mm -hmm. they certainly. I mean, there was a lot of admiration for him, mm -hmm. liking because mm -hmm. he was. Um, wasn't keeping any secrets. He said, look at this wonderful stuff. Wow. So there's a uh, memo from Vernon Tate to Klaus Liebman dated June 20th, 1950, about a special assignment, job assignment for you to work half-time for Klaus Liebman. Um, and it said that you were uh, preparing course syllabuses, translating excerpts of German and French texts, copying musical examples to be used in lectures, and preparing visual aids. Do you remember much about that, that work? Well, I thought that was for the book, but maybe not for Liebmann's book. But that's not uh, right, is it? No. Uh, yeah, I remember doing some of that. Uh, maybe some of the, your work eventually went to the into the book as well, possibly. He might have used that. So. I, he might have. I, I, I know he, I knew he was writing a book. Right. And that was that book called The Language of Music? Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Oh. Which I think is a quite good book. Yes, it is. Don't you? Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, um, do you, uh, so you, do you recall at all how that, that position might have come about? I mean, it looks like Klaus really respected you, your musical knowledge and your abilities, because that's... Um, well, yeah, I mean, also, you know, in a way, it was very convenient. I, w I was right here. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. It's 
So you mentioned to me also it translated a um, intimate vocal text for Klaus Liebman. Um, mm -hmm. you, uh, it must have been from Matis, was it from uh, Matis? That's what I think. That's what you said over the phone to me. Yeah, I think so. I, uh -huh. You know, I don't remember what text it was, but I mean, I really, you know, one of the most beautiful things that Hindemith ever wrote, in my opinion, is uh, Das Marienleben. Mm -hmm. And it might have been from that, but I'm right. not sure. And there was a performance of that in the music library with Phyllis Curtin and yes. Greg Tucker. Yes. Did you hear that? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow. I mean, she really was a heavenly soprano. Wow. So, um, when you did that, that translation of the Hindemith for Klaus Liebman, was it for um, program notes or something, or do you know what the translation was for? I don't remember. For? No, I don't remember what it was for. He just said, do this, and I did it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. So with the, the music library collection, it seems like there was a big emphasis on, on um, recordings. Um, was that kind of the primary focus and then supported with, with books and scores, or did you feel like there was an, uh, an equal emphasis on no, there wasn't quite yet, because, you know, there were kids who couldn't read scores, mm -hmm. obviously. Where would they have learned? They, they may have been in the process of learning right. to read them and to perform. Uh, and um, books circulated because, you know, biographies, for example, and so forth, they, they would read and, and enjoy. And, but I think the emphasis definitely was on recordings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Klaus Liebman in, uh, in a report of his, he mentions a gift to the library of complete works of Bach, Beethoven, and Brahms, and he was quite um, excited about that and in hoping that more students would learn to read scores. And yes, yes. Yeah. Well, that was another thing. I loved it, you know, because, of course, I have this weakness for the, the classical composers, and so I was listening to some Brahms, and I said, well, I like it, but, you know. And, Bra and Klaus said to me, you have to be middle-aged to like Brahms. <laughs> 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 Which has turned out to be true. <laughs> wow. So, um, besides the, the core classical um, repertoire that was in the, the library, the, the, obviously there was some, some modern music that um, Greg Tucker was helping collect. Yes. Was there much in the way of jazz or popular music or folk music? Folk mu there was quite a lot of folk music. It was, it was wonderful because it was the collection that, um, what was the head of MIT? After Stratton, who was the president, um, he helped. He helped to collect folk music. Oh, um, Wiesner. Wiesner. Yeah, right. Jerry Wiesner. Right, right. So you know, we had a lot of that. Uh -huh. It was fantastic. I can remember playing uh, women's w women's voices, Russian women's voices, working at agriculture. I guess. And they had these songs that went with them, and they were just mind-boggling, fantastic. Yeah. yeah but Jerry also Wiesner, American, also. Right. Yeah, Jerry Wiesner was very interested in folk music. He had actually done some, some um, actually field recordings. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, th we had all that, pretty much. Mm -hmm. Wow. What, what you could get, you know, it was... And I'm sorry, I forget the name of the labels now. You know, it's been so long, but there was a certain label where you could get... Not, I, don't, I think his may have been recorded somewhere like... No, it would have been recorded in the 30s and 40s, uh -huh. wouldn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was Library of Congress okay. stuff. Um, and some Smithsonian... Uh, Smithsonian, yeah. that's, that's yeah. it, right. Because right. he had worked for Smithsonian. Yes, yes exactly. And, you, right. and those were records that were just amazing, wonderful to get. Yeah, yeah. And those are still considered very valuable recordings. Uh, right. I bet. I bet. No, I, I, they were very uh, moving, very exciting. Mm -hmm. 
Was there much in the way of, of jazz records in the library at the time? Um, medium, I would say. Mm -hmm. I, I know, you know, f f blues, there were blues mm -hmm. records here, but I don't remember. Certainly not the stuff that was really in for the children, yeah. for the for the boys, I should yeah. say. Uh, you know, I was clueless. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and I don't think it, there was anybody out there that was recommending uh, that we should get it. Right. So I guess at the time there were also foreign language records in the library, mm -hmm. um, I guess to support some of the foreign language classes. How big a collection was that? Um, I don't really remember, but it was not huge. Uh-huh. No. Uh-huh. Can you tell me more about um, Greg Tucker's um, involvement in the library? I was, he was selecting modern musical ma materials. Was was there any other stuff, that any other things he was helping with the library as far as...? Well, he was, I mean, talk about a delightful man. He was just wonderful. So every time he came in the door, I would be beaming. And he um, was very skilled and had also the nice same democratic attitude that Klaus had. You know, this was not just for special people. This was for everybody. Mm -hmm. And it was a joy to work with him. And anything he said we should have, we got. I mean, it was a given. Mm -hmm. So, no, he was a, really. He also had taught at Harvard and at MIT, and he said he much prefers teaching here because they don't think they're God's gift to the world, mm -hmm. which, you know, is literally the way he put it, which, which makes a difference, and I think it's still true to some extent. Mm -hmm. It, it makes it much more fun to teach them, right. because it's it's you know we're all the same people. I know a little bit more about this, but you know stuff that I don't know. So let's just yeah, cut all the garbage. Yeah, that's still a a, a, a big um, ethic here at, at MIT. I yeah. think. Uh, yeah. And that's and of course you know my husband Vicky was completely like that. I have some questions uh, about him as well. In the library, as far as um, reference books, did you have like the Grove Dictionary of Music and, yes. and um, Baker's Biographical Dictionary? Did you feel he had enough reference materials that you could answer most questions when people came into the library? Yeah, yeah. There were some I couldn't because I couldn't find it. You know, mm -hmm. but yes, yeah. yes, it was. And Grove, of course, is is marvelous. I can remember just recently somebody saying, what actually is a, uh, a Sinfonia Concertante? I said, you know, I mean, I know how it goes, but I'm not really sure how you define it. So somebody looked on the internet and came in with, you know, a paragraph of stuff. Yeah. I said, well, I've got to go home and look in Groves, and Groves said, <laughs> it is a concerto for one or more instruments, basically the same as a concerto, but it's, you know, extended or something, four words or something. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So he was very useful, lovely. Yeah. Um, we've touched on this a little bit. Um, 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 but I have some some quotes from your Anna reports that, oh are, that are that are kind of interesting. You're talking um, explicitly about the the music library's role in educating MIT students and the MIT community about classical music. You talk about spreading musical taste, and you said um, progress was made in broadening the the taste of listeners, largely by exposing them to unfamiliar music played in the music room. So it seemed like you really felt that you were very conscious of that. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it was it was great. Mm -hmm. It was wonderful. I, I must say I fell down to some extent. You know, I didn't play a lot of Wagner, for example. Uh -huh. So <laughs> if they liked Wagner, <laughs> that was too bad. That's understandable. <laughs> but, uh, but I should have. But um, yes, I thought, you know, and it's, it's 
because it's so beautiful and it's so uh, it speaks to so many people it's not hard to spread the word mm -hmm. people enjoy most of it right here's another quote of yours from 1952 the carefully planned purchase of recordings and scores of important modern works has given the library what I believe to be a collection of unusual completeness and excellence in the field of modern music. No effort will be spared to keep up the standard, and thanks are due to Professor Gregory Tucker for his invaluable advice on what to buy. Yeah. Um, so it just speaks more to kind of your enthusiasm for uh, what Greg Tucker was doing. Yes, yes. No, I mean, he's... he. You know, his instincts were perfect, so to speak. Mm -hmm. He really was, um, you know, because for me and I think for many of the students at the time, um, Stravinsky, uh, Hindemith, um, um, Bartok, yeah. Bartok, exactly, yeah. and, and the Englishman. Benjamin Britten. Benjamin Britten, exactly. Yeah. Were, were what we thought was modern music. Yeah. And Greg Tucker said, wait a minute, something has gone on since that time. Mm -hmm. So that was very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So as you mentioned earlier, music was played over the in the, the main um, listening room in the yes. view, uh, reading room in the library. Um, do you know how that got started? Was that from the very beginning? Was that was that planned? Uh, it must have been, well, there must have been a time when we weren't playing it and then that somehow came up because I remember being, you know, I wasn't complaining, but when I would get home, I would never feel like playing any records because I had just heard records for six hours. <laughs> uh -huh. So there was a certain amount of muttering at home because I... I said, I just can't, I can't use any more music today. So it, I don't think it was always the case, but very early on it, it came to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And who selected uh, the, the music? Was it um, kind of formally programmed or was it more on the fly? Well, it was programmed in that we said, you know, we this is the time for operas and and this is where my sort of, quote, fight with the boys would come uh -huh. in because I would say, you know, you can't play the same stuff all the time. Yeah. Come on. Yeah. So, you know, you would um, play whatever uh, mixed early and late quartets and mixed early and late symphonies. And the, the boys would decide pretty much. Mm -hmm. They had a they had a category, but within that, they would have a choice. Mm -hmm. Because I also thought, you know, I can't impose my taste. It's a good idea to have these various people selecting the music. Right, right. So that's that's how it worked. And of course, they loved that mm -hmm. because they would eagerly look forward to playing right. what they liked. Right. <laughs> So how many hours a day, approximately, was music played over the, uh, the Six. stereo? Six. Uh -huh. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but sometimes I had the things on, too, so so I could type and stuff. Right. And peace and quiet. Were there some, uh, a, a separate study room if somebody came to the library and needed to, to, to do some studying but didn't want to be disturbed by the... Well, there was a there were listening rooms yeah. that had doors, uh -huh. but I would, um, you know, I guess I was a little bit bossy about how much work they could spread out. Mm -hmm. You know, I said if you're coming in here to listen to music, listen to it. Yeah. But I mean, obviously, they did work also. Mm -hmm. One of the other big discussions we had was I wouldn't let them there was ROTC in those days and I wouldn't let them bring rifles into the library because I couldn't stand it so they would leave them outside like 
really good kids. <laughs> so, um, beginning in the school year of 1951-52, uh, the music library was open on Saturday nights for Boston Symphony broadcasts. Mm -hmm. Were you? Um, did you come and supervise those no. those events? No, uh -huh. no, I didn't. I I don't know who did, but it wasn't me. Uh huh. Uh -huh. According to reports, it was very popular. I'm uh -huh. sure. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, it was a good move, but, um, you know, since I worked eight hours a day, that was... Right, right. Um, there were concerts in the, the library. Do you remember how that got started? Um, well, I'm sure it was Klaus's suggestion, uh -huh. yes. Yes. That's what I mean, you know, he had a wide interest and was full of energy. Mm -hmm. He was not... He was not retiring. If he met you, he would say, I thought of something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. So I see that there had been a, um, a, a concert, I think during your time, by the pianist Ernst Levy. Was he, at one point, he was actually on the music faculty here, but when he gave that concert, uh, do you know if he was on the faculty? I there? don't know. Um, then we mentioned the um, the Phyllis Curtin um, yes. Hindemith. Yeah. There is also something you mentioned in one of your reports, and I'd never heard about this this organization. But there was um, Professor Theodore Wood had a folk singing society. It was called the Lali Tan Society. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, do you know much about that organization? This was my first kind of. I don't know much about it, but Ted Wood was a wonderful singer and played the guitar. Uh -huh. he, he, he was a great guy, and he spent a fair amount of time in the music library. Um, he was friends with Klaus and Greg Tucker, and um, he, you know, he would... There were evenings where he would perform, and I guess other people... I'd, yeah, there were these events where they had the events in the music library, mm -hmm. according to these reports. Yes, uh, yes. Which department was he was he from? Humanities. Uh -huh. Yes, uh -huh. he taught English. Yeah. He also he was he once uh, had Robert Frost come. Oh my! Which was pretty exciting. Uh, wow. Was was that event at the music library? Do you know? I don't remember where it was because he would have pulled in more people than would fit in the music library, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I don't know. It was in some bigger room. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's interesting. I hadn't known about... Yeah, he was he was really an excellent folk singer and did a lot of it. Wow, wow. Um, so getting back to more questions about Klaus Liebman, as we said earlier, he came in, in 1947. Um, um, prior to his coming in 1947, there's, um, there, was there was music um, going on. It goes way, way back. Yes. Um, there was a gentleman, George Dunham, who was director of the MIT Glee Club before Klaus Liebman. Did you know George Dunham at all? No. I mean, I never, I never got to the Boston area till 1948. I see. Yep. Uh -huh. um, with um, Klaus Liebman, do you know what the circumstances were that brought him to the United States? Did he ever talk to you about that? Well, no, but he was he was either half or whole Jewish, mm -hmm. and, and would have to have left Germany. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know how he got here, and his wife too, mm -hmm. Ollie, who was really nice and was a costume maker for a theater um, no um, mm -hmm. but but you know it's obviously a, a yeah. result of him right, right. Yeah. do you know what music teaching positions he had prior to coming to MIT no sorry yeah um, do you know how it came that MIT hired him there there are various um, things out there, and I'm wondering if he talked to you about how that. No, came he about. never did. Uh -huh. He was he was pretty future oriented, you know. Uh -huh. 
-hmm. what are we going to do next? <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, as a trained violinist that he was, um, he seemed to be particularly focused on the, 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 um, the, 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 the choral um, music here. Yes. Do you know yeah. why that was? I mean, it's... Well, I would suppose partly that it would build on what the boys had already been exposed to, you know, mm -hmm. their decalps and all kinds of things from which they came. Right. They were used to singing. Mm -hmm. And there, there, were, there were certainly people who played instruments, some of them very, very well, but um, the, the larger number would be oriented toward choral singing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and as we mentioned earlier, you had sang in a performance of Handel's Messiah conducted by um, Klaus with the MIT Choral Society. What was he like as a conductor? He was... Um, I didn't think he, he was uh, patient enough. In other words, I think a c good choral conductor has to make you go over things without any impatience, you know, by explaining what he wants and then you would try to do it. And he would be a little bit, uh, come on, you know, get your act together, do it. Well, if you don't know what you're doing, that's hard to do because mm -hmm. he has to explain exactly. So he was he was pleasant, but I don't think he was terribly skilled in getting the best performance out of us because mm -hmm. he didn't quite know how to do that. Mm -hmm. But you know, yeah, there are probably many varied opinions about it. I've played under some conductors who talk about the music that we're rehearsing and not just um, rehearsing specific things. Did he ever talk about why he liked the, the music uh, or a particular, um, particular uh, piece? Well, with Handel, I mean, yes, mm -hmm. of course he would. Yeah, I mean, how could you not have great respect, you know, for how, how beautifully Handel said some of that? Yeah. I mean, about the sheep. Yeah. Yes, he did. He did. Mm -hmm. Did you see him conduct the MIT Symphony at all? I must have, but I don't remember. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else uh, we move, before we move on to other things? Anything else about Klaus Liebman that you want to talk about, either as a person or musician? And not really. It was. Oh, he had a secretary whom I liked a lot. Her name was Cherry something, who was hard of hearing, which was hard on her. And sometimes, you know, we would joke, he, he would come in a little late. I think he liked to sleep in the morning or something. And then at one point, Cherry saw some prints of she thought it was his pajamas on his sleeve, and she said, you know, he must have really rushed because he still got the prints of his pajamas on his sleeve. And I said, well, I think older people have the impressions longer than younger people, so <laughs> give him a little slack here, you know. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, no, he was, he was a nice man. And at one point, I think Ollie got sick. quite seriously sick and I offered to go and do some housework for him and he said, no, it's okay, we have somebody. Quite a human, a human person. Nice. And we were talking earlier about um, Professor Gregory Tucker. He came you know, a year after um, Klaus Liebman in 1948 um, and he was um, Looks like he uh, organized lots of chamber music events at MIT. Did mm -hmm. you go to any of the stuff that he organized? I'm sure I did, but I don't 
I don't recall some. I mean, I admired him very much. Mm -hmm. he, he was a person of substance. Mm -hmm. And as you know, he was also a composer. Did you hear much of his music? No. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Do you know if any of the concerts in the music library, did they play any of his music? Yeah. I, I yeah. don't remember. I'm mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. He also wrote a lot of music for, um, for theater. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I'm wondering if he had gone to any theatrical productions that he might have written no. music for. No. Yeah. Um, and John Corley, who was conductor of the MIT Concert Band from 1948 through 1999, um, wow. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, yes. Uh, so you you knew him a little bit? I knew him a little bit, and he was, again, a very pleasant, cheery man. Huh. Mm -hmm. um, there was a, um, the, the, the student jazz band was called the Tectonians. Did mm -hmm. you ever hear them play? No. Uh-huh. Sorry. Um, or um, other concerts on campus. There was a series called the Humanities Series. I, I guess that Greg Tucker must have started that, it looks like. Yeah, well, I'm sure I heard some of those concerts, mm -hmm. but I, I don't recall a specific one. Mm -hmm. um, what about, re you, 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 obviously, you, I think you mentioned earlier, you'd heard some Klaus Liebman and Greg Tucker playing. Um, were there, was there concerts here in the library or some other concerts on, on campus? Uh, you know, again, I don't recall where those big events were. Mm -hmm. um, I, I really can't come up with where it took place. Mm -hmm. So after you left um, MIT, you became a full-time mother, a very distinguished profession, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> people often forget. So, um, tell me about your your, um, your your children a little bit. Oh, sure. Well, Matthew, actually, who is the oldest, went to MIT as an undergraduate. It was funny because his counselor at Newton High School said, you haven't got a Chinaman's chance of getting into MIT. <laughs> Turned out to be wrong, so he did, and he he loved being here. Um, it's also interesting that at the time, I don't know how it is now. They, I don't think they had sort of a core curriculum. He was a biologist, uh -huh. and you know when he got ready to graduate, I asked him whether he knew roughly when Napoleon was alive, and he thought very hard and said. Uh, I think <laughs> at around the turn of the 18th to the 19th century, which was pretty good. But the only course he had taken, you know, in what to me meant a lot, mm -hmm. history, was Darwin, Marx, and Freud. That was it. <laughs> wow. Wow. So, you know, <laughs> it's kind of funny. Anyway, he has, he, he then got to be a graduate student here and met his wife as a graduate student also. I must say, they didn't get married for 14 years, and mm -hmm. we thought, you know, when they get out of here, they'll have to get postdocs. They can't possibly get them in the same place, but they did. Mm -hmm. Finally, they had to get a job. They can't possibly get them in the same place, but they did. Fantastic. <laughs> so 14 years later. Wow. They did get married, and they have two lovely children. So I'm going to see them this summer. Wow! So what's his his profession? He's a geneticist uh -huh. at at um, Stanford Medical School. Mm -hmm. And his wife is uh, also a biologist I at see. Stanford mm -hmm. Medical School. Wow! <laughs> wow. <laughs> They're both in the National Academy, so I'm pretty proud of them. Wow. So anyway, and then the next one is Becky, and she's a weaver in New Hampshire, and her husband teaches at Tuck, which is the business school at Dartmouth. And then there's Moni, who is a kindergarten teacher, and is married to a wonderful man, and they have four children who, thank goodness, live in Needham. And so I see them a lot, and the two oldest girls went to Brown, and 
and they're two boys, one of whom is at UNH and one is going to UMass. Charming children, just great. And then um, the last one is Duncan, who so far has been in the Far East for 20 years, in, living in Hong Kong. And he's now moving to Sao Paulo, Brazil, which right. at least is in the more or less same time zone. So I'm grateful for small favors. Yeah. So what profession? He's a, he's a businessman. Uh -huh. he's, he works for Adidas. And he's married to a Turk, a Turkish girl, who's a Muslim. And um, they have two darling little girls. And, you know, I wish I had been there when... Asli is her name, went to her parents and said, I'm going to marry an American and we're going to live in Hong Kong. <laughs> so anyway, they're great children. I love them dearly. I sometimes, you know, write one, a one or the other a letter saying it's a letter to one of my four favorite children. <laughs> my. So you were later married to the physicist Victor uh, Weisskopf, who was uh, a significant figure in 20th century physics. Um, he came to MIT in 1945 and retired in 1974. Um, uh, he was also a fairly accomplished pianist. Mm -hmm. um, he was. Um, can you talk about him as a as a pianist? And um, do you want do you want do you have any comments about that? Uh, well, I mean, uh, mostly I have comments about him as a human being because mm -hmm. he was a completely outstanding human being who, who would confront people as if he were very glad to see them and very interested in what they had to say, mm -hmm. everybody. And that's a great virtue. Not many people yeah. have that. So that was the best thing about him. He was a real miracle. And he, uh, yes, he played the piano very well and had the same sort of predilections as I have. <laughs> you know, mostly, uh, he, I think to some extent on the piano, his favorite composers were Beethoven and Schubert. Uh -huh. And he had a sort of romantic approach to playing the piano. Mm -hmm. uh, I read that he was nice. also friends with the uh, composer Georgi Ligeti. Yes, he was. Um, did he play any of Ligeti's music? No, too hard. Uh -huh. um, he also was friends with a person from Cambridge, a composer. Well, I'll call you if the name occurs okay. to me. He's also a very good composer, you know, American contemporary, still alive. So, yes, and he, in his youth at one point, he was working with a physicist in Leipzig, but as a side job, he would review concerts in oh. the papers. Uh -huh. <laughs> wow. So, that was fun. Do you know what his musical training was and who he might he, have studied with? Oh, he had, he, he had a teacher in Vienna whose name was Mr. Thornton but because Vicky knew him when he was when he could only speak German and French he called him Mr. Thornton uh -huh. so Mr. Thornton must have been a lovely man and I don't think he ever really went further with it because his his parents uh, advised him, he said, you know, I can either be a musician or a scientist. And they said, well, if you're a second-rate musician, you're not going to go very far, so why don't you be a scientist? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he was not a second-rate scientist. We, we know about <laughs> that. <laughs> but he had to be accomplished enough. He was um, played violin and piano sonatas with Eugene uh, Lehner. Yes, he did. DSO. Yes. And oh, he, I mean... Lehner was so wonderful, you know, because he was, he basically did most of his work on the viola, but of course knew how to play the violin. So, Yanni Lehner would say, now we're both amateurs, I'm playing the violin, you're playing the piano, yeah. we're fine. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, the 
reason he got to know Lehner very well is that his Lehner's wife, Luca, is Danish, and Biggie's first wife, Ellen, was Danish. Right. So they were very close, and that got to be a wonderful friendship, and it that continues with their children still. Wow. Um. But they, you know, they were concert goers. Ricky went to everything he could get his hands on. Um, on the phone, I asked you if um, if Vicky had um, had known Albert Einstein as a violinist, and you you had some comments about um, <laughs> his views of Albert Einstein as well, a violinist. Well, yes, he he. I don't think he played the violin wonderfully, but he he did play it. And what Vicky said is, you know, he he's kind of a second-rate violinist, but he's one of the greatest physicists that ever lived. So. Mm -hmm. We'll, we'll take him as a second rate yeah. violinist. <laughs> Do you know how often he played with, with Einstein? Not very often, Not I very don't often. think. Yeah. No, no. But uh, but Einstein used to have people come out to, to Princeton for that particular purpose, to play with Right. Him. I've heard about that. Yeah. 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 Were there any MIT um, colleagues that he played music with? There's lots of faculty music. Ah, yes, there was. And I'm trying to think of his name. A violinist also. Physicist. And I can't think of his name right now. I'm sorry. He may also have been from Harvard. I'm not quite sure. So to, to wrap up um, things, are there any topic that I um, that I failed to talk about that you wanted to, to mention, or any stories or anything you wanted to, to read? Well, um, you know, sometimes the kids would ask me who was who I thought was the greatest soprano that ever lived, you know, mm -hmm. or questions like that, which is fun. And I can remember I would say Gali Kurchi. And then they would all busily listen to Gali Kurchi, which was good for them anyway, and mm -hmm. she was a miracle. Um, so the only person that once appeared at the music library who was rather unusual was Alfred P. Sloan. He came in, and I knew that there was a lot of excitement about his coming. You know, I suppose, I mean, the Sloan School must have come from somewhere came from him. So at the time, you know, I knew he had something to do with cars. I was totally clueless about the fact that he was running the General Motors Corporation, which was the largest corporation in the U.S. I forget it. I had no idea. But I was polite to him, and he wanted to see the music library, so I showed him around. And, um, you know, it was getting a little bit embarrassing because I didn't know his name. There he was. So after a while, he looked at me and said, this is Mr. Sloan. <laughs> and I thought, okay, <laughs> but how do you answer that? <laughs> you <know? laughs> so this is Mr. Sloan turned out to be a big benefactor to MIT, it turns yeah, out. <laughs> yeah. wow. So that was a jolly story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to thank you very much for your generosity of coming in today, and you've had a lot to contribute here. This well, is just fantastic. I don't know. I forget names. I'm embarrassed, but you do the best I well. can. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome.